Chapter Two of Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hopalong Cassidy's Roundup by Clarence Edward Mulford. Chapter Two: The Rashness of Shorty. Buckskin was very hot. In fact, it was never anything else. Few people were on the streets, and the town was quiet. Over in the Houston Hotel, a crowd of cowboys was lounging in the barroom. They were very quiet, a condition as rare as it was ominous. Their mounts, twelve in all, were switching flies from their quivering shins in the corral at the rear. Eight of these had a large C-80 branded on their flanks, the other four a double arrow. In the barroom, a slim, wiry man was looking out of the dirty window up the street at Cowan's saloon. Shorty was complaining. They sure ought to be here now. They rounded up last week. The man nearest assured him they would come. The man at the window turned and said, They's here now. In front of Cowan's, a crowd of nine happy-go-lucky daredevil riders were sliding from their saddles. They threw their reins over the heads of their mounts and filed in to the bar. Laughter issued from the open door, and the clink of glasses could be heard. They stood in picturesque groups, strong, self-reliant, humorous, virile. Their expensive sombreros were pushed far back on their heads, and their hairy chaps were covered with the alkali dust from their ride. Cohen, bottle in hand, pushed out several more glasses. He kicked a dog from under his feet and looked at Buck. "'Round it up yet?' he inquired. "'Sure. Day afore yesterday,' came the reply. The rest were busy removing the dust from their throats, and gradually drifted into groups of two and three. One of these groups strolled over to the solitary card-table, and found Jimmy Price resting in a cheap chair, his legs on the table. "'I wish you'd extricate your delicate feet from off on this yar table, James.' humbly requested Lanky Smith, morally backed up by those with him. "'Yes, they sure is delicate, Mr. Smith,' responded Jimmy without moving. "'We wants to play draw, Jimmy,' explained Pete. "'You're sure welcome to play it if you wants to. "'Didn't I tell you when you growed that mustache that you didn't have to ask me any more?' queried the placid James paternally. "'Call him off, sonny.' Pete says he can clean me out. Anyhow, you can have the first deal, promised Lanky. I'm sure sorry for Pete if he can't. You don't reckon I has to have first deal to beat you fellers, do you? Go away and let me alone. I never seen such a bunch for button in as you fellers. Billy Williams returned to the bar. Then he walked along it until he was behind the recalcitrant possessor of the table. While his aggrieved friends shuffled their feet uneasily to cover his approach, he tiptoed up behind Jimmy and, with a nod, grasped that indignant individual firmly by the neck while the others grabbed his feet. They carried him, twisting and bucking, to the middle of the street and deposited him in the dust, returning to the now vacant table. Jimmy rested quietly for a few seconds, then slowly arose dusting the alkali from him. "'The wall-eyed perutes,' he muttered, and then scratched his head for a way to play hunk. As he gazed sorrowfully at the saloon, he heard a snicker from behind him. He, thinking it was one of his late tormentors, paid no attention to it. Then a cynical, biting laugh stung him. He wheeled to see Shorty leaning against a tree, a sneering leer on his flushed face. Shorty's right hand was suspended above his holster, hooked to his belt by the thumb, a favorite position of his when expecting trouble. "'One of your regular habits,' he drawled. Jimmy began to dust himself in silence, but his lips were compressed to a thin white line. "'Does they hurt you?' pursued the onlooker. Jimmy looked up. "'I heard tell that they make glue out in cayuses sometimes, he remarked. Shorty's eyes flashed. The loss of that horse had been rankling in his heart all day. 
Does they get you frequent? he asked. His voice sounded hard. Oh, about as frequent as you lose a cayuse, I reckon, replied Jimmy hotly. Shorty's hand streaked to his holster, and Jimmy followed his lead. Jimmy's colt was caught. He had bucked too much. As he fell, Shorty ran for the Houston house. Pistol shots were common, for they were the universal method of expressing emotions. The poker players grinned, thinking their victim was letting off his indignation. Lanky sized up his hand and remarked half-audibly, "'He's a sure good kid.' The bartender, fearing for his new, beveled, gilt-framed mirror, gave a hasty glance out the window. He turned around, made change, and remarked to Buck, "'Your kid, Jimmy, is plugged.' Several of the more credulous craned their necks to see, Buck being the first. "'Judas!' he shouted, and ran out where Jimmy lay coughing, his toes twitching. The saloon was deserted, and a crowd of angry cowboys surrounded their chum-a-boy. Buck had seen Shorty enter the door of the Houston house, and he swore, "'Chase them C-80 and Arrow Cayuses behind the saloon, Pete, and get under cover.' Jimmy was choking, and he coughed up blood. "'He's—' Sure got me. My gun stuck, he added apologetically. He tried to sit up, but was not able and looked surprised. It's pretty darn hot out here, he suggested. Johnny and Billy carried him in the saloon and placed him by the table, in the chair he had previously vacated. As they stood up, he fell across the table and died. Billy placed the dead boy's sombrero on his head and laid the refractory six-shooter on the table. I wonder who the dirty killer was. He looked at the slim figure and started to go out, followed by Johnny. As he reached the threshold, a bullet zipped past him and thudded into the frame of the door. He backed away and looked surprised. That's Shorty's shooting. He always misses about that much. He looked out and saw Buck standing behind the live oak that Shorty had leaned against, firing at the hotel. Turning around, he made for the rear, remarking to Johnny that they's in the Houston. Johnny looked at the quiet figure in the chair and swore softly. He followed Billy. Cohen, closing the door and taking the buffalo gun from under the bar, went out also and slammed the rear door forcibly. End of chapter 2